welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very happy and honored uh, to share the last panel of uh, this conference. Uh, in this panel, we shall uh, discuss some issues which may arise in the near future once collective redress will be more widespread in Europe. Uh, our members of the panel are uh, from the US, Justice Robert Dow, who serves as a district judge for the Northern District of Illinois, is now also the chair of the advisory committee on civil rules. He has law degrees from Yale, Oxford, and Harvard, and perhaps the most, most famous judge in this area of class action. From Europe, we have Professor Yannick Katsenkova, who is a law professor at Tilburg University, the Netherlands, and holds the first European chair on mass claim dispute resolution since 2007. In view of her outstanding international experience and reputation both in the academia and in practice with all the aspects of mass claim dispute resolution, which are discussed, dis discussed during this conference, she probably needs no further introduction and Professor Geraint Hoyles, who is speaking from the UK, the former dean of the law school of, in Manchester, the former dean of the faculty of law at the City University of Hong Kong, and the future executive dean of the business and public policy and law at NUI Galloway. Previously, a barrister at Gaff Chambers, and the chair of the International Association of Consumer Law, certainly one of the greatest legal experts in the area of consumer law. From France and England, uh, where we have Duncan Frank Fergrieve, who is an academic and lawyer practicing as a French advocate and English barrister, all at the same time. He holds contemporaneously academic position at the Le Université de Paris de Fen, where he is a professor of comparative law and the British Institute of International and Comparative Law in London. I could have continued with every panel member for a long time, but I had to shorten their CVs. Now for the question, uh, maybe I will start with uh, Justice Dow, uh, it seems to me that with the proliferation of collective redress in Europe, we will see attempts to circumvent class action by the incorporation of arbitration and jurisdiction clauses, sometimes known as forum choice provisions. And I would like to hear from you how the US jurisdiction dealt with these clauses. Great. Well, thank you, Please. Ariel. And uh, thank you, everybody. It's a delight to be with you all, even if virtually. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for having to flake out on you at uh, 8, uh, I guess that would be 6.30 uh, London time, which is uh, unfortunately 12.30 here, still in the middle of the day in Chicago. And I've got a, another case I have to attend to with the lawyers, but, uh, but I'll stick with you for the half hour that I can. Um, I've been asked to say a few words about arbitration clauses in the United States that have been used to curtail certain class actions. And to set the stage, I'm gonna go back to 1966 when the modern version of our Rule 23, which is the class action rule was born. And I've heard Professor Arthur Miller, who was one of the authors of the 1966 amendments tell this story enough times. And he tells it with uh, so well that I feel like I ought to give credit where credit is due. So this is really a tribute to Arthur that I can even tell this story. Um, so the primary concern of the rule of drafters back in those days was to advance uh, injunctive class actions, kind of in the Brown versus Board of Education model. And the damages class actions that are reflected in Rule 23b3 were, were the secondary concern. And uh, what, the, what Arthur refers to as the negative value claims was something that was foremost in their minds because the idea was that there may be certain claims of modest value that would not be worth litigating on an economically viable uh, basis unless they could be collectivized. And they had in mind the making it viable to actually pursue those claims. 
Now, Professor Miller would acknowledge that the rule has taken off in ways that the framers did not uh, foresee and that uh, over the last half century, uh, class actions have evolved in ways that were hardly imaginable in 1966. Um, there has been a proliferation of uh, both private rights of action rec rec recognized by judges and also uh, legislation that's uh, created new causes of action, uh, particularly in the consumer area. Uh, and also, I don't think anyone would ever have envisioned class actions that were worth billions and billions of dollars, which is what we see sometimes today. So uh, a lot of observers, including Professor Miller and a lot of our other uh, great class action experts here in the American professoriate would have thought of the, the 90s and the early 2000s as the golden age of class actions. But uh, I've also heard it said that uh, the first uh, decade, the uh, last decade and a half or so, I've heard it described as the empire strikes back. Uh, and that I think is an accurate uh, statement because there have been a number of uh, actions that companies have taken in particular uh, that have been blessed by the courts uh, that have uh, got, uh, carved back the class action device a bit. And the landmark case in which this arbitration clause uh, provision came up was called AT&T versus Concepcion. And in that case, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the enforceability of a, an arbitration clause that had been challenged under California state law uh, as, a, as an unconscionable, unconscionable provision in a contract. And the Supreme Court basically held that the Federal Arbitration Act and the policy in favor of arbitration that was advanced in that act trumped any kind of state law provision that would uh, consider such a provision unconscionable. Uh, the, I think the, uh, the uh, Concepcion lawsuit was a good example of what Professor Miller was talking about when he was referring to uh, uh, negative value claims. I think the value of the claim for the Concepcion's is $30.22, which um, as Judge Posner once colorfully said, only a lunatic or a fanatic sues for $30. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that might not be viable with an arbitration clause. There is a subsequent case called Italian Colors, in which the Supreme Court basically reinforced what it said in Concepcion about the uh, federal policy of arbitration as reflected in the act uh, uh, being more powerful than a state law that would suggest otherwise. Um, so uh, I guess my, my short version before turning this over to Ionica to talk about the European perspective on this I don't see uh, the, our Supreme Court uh, losing its appetite for enforcing arbitration clauses or forum selection clauses or any other uh, uh, contractual provision um, and instead uh, uh, following what the dissenters in, in Italian colors and, and Concepcion would have said, which was, uh, I think, uh, more in tune with what Professor Miller would, would be referring to in terms of having the class action device actually advance uh, negative value claims. But I think there has been some pushback. And the example I will give is, I know that there are a lot of law firms that, that have had arbitration clauses in their employment contracts with lawyers and staff uh, to boot. And I think there have been a lot of law students who have pushed back against that. And again, that's a situation where the market, uh, if you can exert enough leverage as law students can with their future employers, a lot of law firms have taken those provisions out because they don't want the controversy that's associated with them. I don't think there are a lot of groups that have, will have as much leverage or bargaining power or ability to organize as law students will with law firms. So I would suspect that our, our corporations will continue uh, to include these provisions and that our Supreme Court will continue to uphold them. Uh, I will turn it over to you, Ionica, for, for the rest. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions on that though. Thanks, Bob. Um... Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for staying with us until the very end. Um, arbitration clauses in Europe. Um, when we discuss any topic in relation to collective redress, we always need to ask ourselves two things. First of all, where are we in Europe? And secondly, in which area of law are we talking about? Um, in the context, uh, in relation to um, arbitration clauses, um, uh, they are in three areas of law. Um, where they have been rejected uh, on different reasons. Uh, in competition cases, uh, it was tried um, in the paraffin wax um, matter um, by the cartel members to 
um, refer cases or deny the court jurisdiction um, based on arbitration clauses in the contracts with the direct purchasers. And the ECJ ruled and said that, that, that such clauses do not um, cover claims based on torts because that would not be appropriate. So, uh, so far for the attempt to um, circumvent collective redress uh, via arbitration clauses in competition matters in Europe. Uh, the second area of law uh, that is not worthy and it's entirely different than what, from what we see in the United States is in the area of consumer law. Um, they are um, a very recent um, example from just last year. Um, um, Ali Express, which is this Chinese company selling online, I haven't purchased anything, but my kids have, and I know it's very cheap, but not if you have a dispute because there is an arbitration clause that you need to go to an arbitration institute in Hong Kong. Um, that is not compliant with European um, regulations and European legislation. And last year, uh, the consumer associations in five member states uh, filed complaints with the local national regulators and the action is also being uh, coordinated, I've been told, by BEUK, the European uh, Pan-European Consumer Association, to uh, force um, AliExpress to change uh, their, um, uh, their terms and conditions. Uh, because in Europe, consumers are protected and um, can, uh, be, uh, can decide in cases of, dispute, um, of disputes uh, to file um, uh, before the court, not just before a court, but even before the court of their um, home country. And then the final category of cases, the investor cases, that is in one of the cases that uh, was mentioned earlier today by uh, Jeremy from uh, Pomerant Petrobras. Um, equally, um, the bylaws of the shareholder agreements had a clause um, that arbitration uh, at, in Brazil should be followed. Uh, that was upheld in the United States. Uh, but the Dutch court interpreting the clause on the Brazil Brazilian law and on the Dutch law um, uh, came to the conclusion that the clause was not sufficiently clear and not exclusive enough to prevent uh, the investors of seeking collective redress before the courts. So for everybody on the corporate side who is involved in types of matters, pay attention on the language and of um, the arbitration clauses. So that is what I have to say from a European perspective. Thank you, Yannicka. And just before turning to our friend in England and in France, I'd like to ask you another question, uh, Justice uh, Dow. There's a constant tension in Europe between state, member states, and general European uh, legislation. I was wondering, if Europeans can learn from the way federal and state courts are, monitor, are monitoring litigation in the US. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, our, our federalism is a little different because we have the supremacy clause, which means the federal always wins when there's a, a tug of war. But in litigation, it, it's, it's um, there are lots of cases that cannot be all consolidated in federal court. So you're necessarily going to have, for, for jurisdictional reasons, parallel proceedings. And some of these parallel proceedings have thousands and thousands of cases. So the judicial panel and multi-district litigation will take all the federal cases in all 94 districts and put them together with a single district judge. But that's not all the cases because uh, there are some cases that will have uh, uh, only uh, jurisdiction in the state courts. And there are a number of states, California, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, I think there are others uh, that have um, a sort of a, a mechanism that's kind of like the JPML that will put it together all the cases in California with a single judge or all the cases in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, whatever it may be. But you will have uh, 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 two different lines of cases basically on the same topic. Opioids is a good example. We have a, a gigantic MDL in Ohio on the opioid litigation. But there are also state court cases in uh, you know, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, I and mean, you can probably name your state, there are cases. Um, I think there's a real value for uh, coordinating these cases. And a lot of judges are very uh, 
uh, insistent on trying to do that. Um, it's old fashioned. You have to either uh, type out an email or pick up the phone. I think picking up the phone is really the best way to do it. And you call your counterpart at the state court and say, I understand that you have all the uh, opioids cases for the state of New Jersey. I'm the federal judge. I've got the opioid cases in the federal system. How can we work together? Uh, I think there are lots of efficiencies to be gained by that, but it's a very informal process. I myself have had proceedings where either I've joined the state court proceeding by telephone, or I've had the state court judge from California join my courtroom by telephone. Uh, I know many of my colleagues have done what they call a two judge panel and one, one of the judges, the federal judge and the other judge is a state judge. The two judges sit together side by side and they'll hear the testimony. Uh, this is pretty common in cases that have expert witnesses. Uh, sometimes in, in uh, big cases also, they'll do something called a science day uh, where the, uh, uh, the lawyers, and, well, and sometimes they'll bring experts as well. They'll put on a PowerPoint and educate the judge on the technology or the pharmaceutical product or whatever it is that's at issue. So if you were gonna do a science day or bring some experts in whose testimony is gonna be challenged in the uh, federal and state cases, let's just say in opioids, for example, you could have both judges sit there. Both judges can hear the same testimony at the same time or get the same tutorial at the same time. And it's even possible that the judges will be applying different standards once they've taken the testimony. Uh, there are lots of states that are still follow the Fry rule for the admission of expert testimony, even though the federal rule is uh, by a case called Daubert. But there's no reason you can't take all the testimony. It's the same facts, it's the same experts, it's just a different standard. It's very efficient for the parties. So I, I hope that um, that is a permissible thing across your boundaries as it is across our boundaries. Um, one thing about the federal rules of civil procedure and also about uh, the judicial panel and multi-district litigation and the MDL. Maybe you can say a word about the removal uh, rules of uh, the Class Action Fairness Act, CAFA. Sure, so that's uh, that's another example of the empire strikes back, I'm afraid <laughs> of. Uh, in, in the mid, uh, the, the, the first decade of, uh, of the century, uh, Congress got involved. They don't get involved very, very often. It's mostly our rules are developed by the, the committee that I'm now the chair of uh, through a, 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 a process uh, that uh, takes input from basically everybody. Once in a while, Congress gets involved. And in this instance, Congress decided to federalize all the larger uh, class actions <coughs> to specific rules. So if you're over a certain threshold, you automatically go to federal court. Um, that doesn't solve all the problems, though, um, uh, because not everything that would be um, uh, useful to be coordinated uh, falls under the jurisdiction of CAFA. And if it doesn't, then the state courts run their own show. And what we've tried to do uh, in, the, in the court system here, and it works very well, I think uh, judges uh, don't see themselves as red and blue as the most the rest of the country does, and uh, we are all very inclined to see ourselves as part of the same team. And uh, uh, comedy is the the principle for that. But I think I've, every time I've called a state court judge, and every time a state court judge has called me, it's actually worked out really good. I think really well for everybody, and I, I'm very happy about that. So it's something I would suggest that that you, you all consider. I don't know. Your, your boundaries may be tighter than ours with federalism, but, but I'm not sure of that. And, uh, and I think there's tremendous benefits for the judges and the I've people. never heard that a judge in, in Netherlands will call a judge in, in uh, Germany or in France. To, Actually, to ask him you might to be surprised. In the case. You might be surprised. It might oh, have, I, it might have I knew you may surprise me. <laughs> In competition cases, actually, really? in the trucks so case. So only you can surprise me. In, in, the, in the UK, in the UK, in the trucks case, um, um, the UK and the Dutch courts are um, informing each other about the case management they are um, uh, deploying. And I think that's a good, I think that's a good thing. But I, I just noticed there is a, a question from Maria so, in the chat. Well, Yes, maybe, maybe. and, and I, I was wondering if ju Justice Dow have seen Professor Maria Glover's question on screen. I have. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to it, but I do agree with the premise that, that um, 
it's more likely that the market, at least in the short term, will be able to um, uh, change this area uh, to the extent it's going to change because I don't think the Supreme Court's likely to uh, retrench from Concepcion or from Italian colors. But um, it's interesting that, uh, you know, this is a, a fairness point, really, that people can, can debate. Uh, and if you can marshal enough strength, I think our corporations are very responsive to the market because they don't want to be perceived as unpopular. And that's exactly what happened to the law firms. Um, and so, you know, it, it, but it, it takes uh, concerted action. And it also takes, um, uh, you know, the, the knowledge to realize that you're going to be the victim of this arbitration clause and your $30 claim isn't going to go anywhere in an arbitration because Judge Posner's right about that. Um, so I, I think that's the right mechanism. I just don't, I'm not aware of any um, a group that's that so far mustered the strength to even make a strong push for it. Thank you. Sure. Yannicka, would you like to say a word about the, how to manage a parallel case in Europe? Oh, that is um, that is another very difficult topic. Ariel, you have you have uh, saved all the difficult questions for me on this panel. Uh, um, when we speak of parallel actions in Europe, there are three um, factors that we need to um, incorporate to understand what is actually going on and what might happen and what the issues are. The first factor is um, we are dealing with a patchwork of collective redress mechanisms. And for our non-European friends, um, just a brief explanation what that could be. That could be assignment of claims to a special purpose vehicle, a claim vehicle, um, often used, um, in, but not only in competition cases. It could be some form of formal uh, aggregation approach, like the English GLO or the German Kapmuk uh, device, which is basically test case selection, um, to rule on common issues, and it could be a more sophisticated, proper, representative collective action. So you have all these different flavors. On top of that, you have the question, um, are we um, in which jurisdiction you are? So dependent, uh, it's, it's not once, once you, 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 you figure out, okay, we have a GLO or we have a formal aggregation, so this is, this is what the situation is in, in England. No, it depends whether you're dealing in a competition case because then you will have a proper representative action. So um, that is one factor. The second factor is, um, are we dealing, um, is the um, uh, European legislative regime on parallel, uh, parallel actions? We have a sp this special provision that says, which is, has not been drafted for collective redress situations, has been drafted for normally ordinary uh, two-party litigation, which says if cases in different European jurisdictions are pending between the same parties and the same action, then the second seized court needs to, to uh, stay the action. Um, that would rarely happen, really, um, in collective redress, but you, because you probably will se seldom find exactly the same parties filing exactly the same case. But here it comes, the second provision um, which um, covers related actions, says that if they are related actions, the second and the third and the fourth and et cetera court may decide to stay the action. And then the question is, what does it mean? When is and how will court exercise its, its powers? Um, and since most um, European member states um, are just starting to introducing their collective redress mechanisms. The judiciary is not um, that comfortable with this type of cases. Um, they are um, less familiar with their, um, they are not that well familiar with their, uh, with the new regimes, let alone with regimes in other jurisdictions. How are they supposed to know and understand whether a GLO in England is the same as a representative uh, action by the Zenatan entity in France? So when this situation occurred, um, that, is, that could be um, really a source of issue um, because it could become very attractive for a judge who doesn't want to deal with the collective action to say, oh, there is this other action pending in Germany. 
um, judges in um, called to rule in a proper representative action um, to say, well, there is this assignment of claims vehicle in in uh, in Germany, or there is this um, GLO in England. I'm going to stay my proceedings, um, and of course, um, this could uh, lead to um, problematic um, um, situation also from policy point of view, because it is, um, you could very easily torpedo, um, to use another um, uh, nice procedural word, um, a proper collective action, because they need to be properly substantiated under the new, um, some, most of the European new regimes. And it's always easier to, to file a, a, a GLO or a CAPMUC um, candidate proceeding. So in theory, you would always be able to torpedo a proper collective action. So to me, these are the issues and how they are going to be resolved, Ariel, I'm not sure, to be honest, uh, but I think a good start would be to educate our judges better in all these different types of collective redress mechanisms and make them aware um, what they are and what they do and what they do not do to make them feel more comfortable and um, when making their, um, their um, uh, considerations to stay actions or not. And on that note, one final remark. Um, it's uh, something that um, a Judge Dow said um, about the, the judges hearing, taking the same depositions, but they may be applying different, different standards. That is something that European judges might be able to do under the European um, regulations on um, um, hearing of evidence, etc. If they are all hearing cases, related cases about related issues, um, they could coordinate evidence taking efforts. Uh, and for example, uh, judges um, that are hearing certain witnesses or expert evidence could join the other panels for that purpose and then use the parties use the collected evidence in the respective jurisdictions. So that could be a start. You, you mentioned this case of the, the truck case in England. So I've been to a hearing in December last year. It was in the Competition Appeal Tribunal in London. There were, the hall was full with about 150 lawyers. Uh, part of them could not enter the room so they they looked at the a screen outside part of the lawyers were english but others came from spain and other jurisdictions all of them came to see a very preliminary discussion on discovery in this case <laughs> so it was amazing yes um, so perhaps, perhaps i shall turn to you duncan now and um, what i was wondering if you can tell us what do you think uh, the directive, the new directive and the efforts in Europe to, uh, to enter some, some sort of uh, regime of collective redress in Europe, what, what would be the outcome and what will be the outcome of these new qu qualified entities and uh, the cooperation that Yannicka is so worried about between courts, but I think that in Europe there's a, a directive that um, consumer, that compels or coordinates consumer organizations. So maybe that will be something to, to work with uh, in order to have a better collective system in Europe. What are your views, I may ask you, Duncan? Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you, Ariel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be, be with you. Um, you. I've been enjoying the sessions as well, um, so it's a great pleasure to to be part of this sort of wrapping up um, session. I just wanted to say a word because I was conscious from from having followed the sessions that there's an amazing array of different perspectives and nationalities. So some may not be necessarily that familiar with what has been happening or not happening in Europe in relation to collective redress. So maybe I'll just say two minutes by way of sort of backdrop to the directive, and then I'll talk about the questions you just raised in relation to the directive and 
bit of crystal ball gazing because I mean the directive is still not passed yet, but some crystal ball gazing really in terms of the the um, provisions that we've got on the table at the moment. Um, I mean the a lot of a, a, a lot of discussion of the is often at a national level looking at the developments uh, in the national systems, and there certainly have been quite a lot of developments in in the European member states. The Netherlands, the UK, France, um, and, and and others as well, um, and at a at a national at an international supranational level, the European Union has actually had a long-standing interest in this area. Um, there has been a lot of discussion over many years um, at the level of European Union. Uh, there has been some interventions there was the injunction injunctions directive but that was a regulatory measure as opposed to a um a damages allowing for damages claims and really the discussion in relation to damages took off i think really around the turn of the century in 2000 uh partly i think um under the impulsion of the competition antitrust perspective private enforcement really um, um, featured on the radar and um, started rekindle the the commission's interest in um, in this area. I think. Plus, also there was a shift away from the purely substantive approach to consumer law to look at enforcement. And the reality, I think, the enforcement was not um, as as good as it should be. And so we have really two developments that are mentioned as a backdrop to this. One is that the, the um, in 2013, the uh, a recommendation of the European Commission, which was adopted, which set out in, in this area in relation to collective redress, which set out a series of common non-binding principles for collective redress. I think quite a lot of people at that time were a bit disappointed <laughs> that it was only a recommendation, that there was a sort of limited ambition about that. And I think in a sense that was, that that maybe disappointment was um, was um, ultimately borne out because um, very few countries have, have really adopted the, uh, the, 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 recommend, the, 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 the recommendations uh, in that instrument in the sense of, of introducing a broad collective redress mechanism. And in fact, the Commission a couple of years ago concluded in a report that there'd only be limited follow up to the actual recommendation. So I suppose a bit of a damp squib in a way uh, that that instrument, but I think you know, it did generate, it, it, it put collective redress on the radar, and I think it played a, played a role at a national level in promoting reforms. What we then, then have Um, politic reaction to what we just said and the 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 the, the, um, the um, limited ambitions in the, the recommendation. The Commission published a proposal for a, a directive on representative actions, and this is part of the New Deal for Consumer package, which covers a whole lot of different areas. Um, but the focus that we we're interested in is, is this, this proposed directive. Um, and um, uh, it was published later in that year. It's been trundling through slowly through the legislative process. And now it is um, on the cusp, really, of being adopted. We think next month it will be adopted and we're going to see this measure go onto the statute book at the European level. Now, what does it do and how does it deal with the things that, that Ariel um, has, ha has raised? I mean, the scope of the directive is quite broad. It's it's certainly broader than the previous injunctions directive, and it covers um, a number of instruments which are laid down in the annex. To that. I don't want to go into detail about 50 or 60 um, measures in there, but it covers really right across the area of consumer law, including product safety, product liability, data protection, telecoms, etc. So in that sense, it's quite broad, although it's not as broad as the recommendation was in 2013. The recommendation um, was expressed to apply to the entirety of EU law. We've come, we've gone sexual in this sense, but very broad sexual in the sense of consumer law and it's in its broadest conception. Um, 
And under the directive, I, I, I don't want to go into too much of details, but I just say one or two things just to set up the discussion about the qualified entities that Ariel was asking about. Under the directive, represented action is defined as an action for the protection of collective interest of consumers that is brought by a qualified entity. There, the, 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 the issue on behalf of consumers seeking injunctive or redress remedy. And redress remedy is quite broad, but includes damages. OK, so we've got damages, the potential damages range now included in this in this um, in the scope of this. Um, and what I think is interesting in directive is what the what sometime academics refer to as the as the gatekeeper to these claims. There's a lot of discussion about what is the appropriate gatekeeper, what's the entry point to it? Uh, and there are various models that one can see across different systems. And there are various models in, in European national systems as to what those, you know, the, who is the gatekeeper to a collective address action. Um, and um, as, as well as you would have realised from what I just said, it's the qualified entity which becomes the controlling factor who's going to bring these, these um, representative actions. And so that's a really a key point of this whole directive as to who is a direct a qualified entity, how they qualified, etc. Because... If that, you know, they're controlling the procedure, they're launching the procedure. Uh, if they're not equipped, if they're not incentivized, if they haven't got the, the resources, et cetera, then, you know, the whole, the, it doesn't matter how good, how broad the, the rest of it is, um, that the, the, the procedure won't work. So the, the directive adopts, it's quite complicated. I mean, it's not the easiest piece of legislation, I have to be said, actually. I mean, Number of us here have been discussing and looking at it. I mean, it's you know, in terms of legal certainty, it's not fantastic. To be honest, there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of same French zone gris area, which is a little bit unclear. But what we do know is that there is so there is a um, a domestic action, a representative action, and a cross border uh, domestic uh, representative action. The domestic and and so the qualif the notion of the qualified entity changes depending upon these two kind of parameters um the domestic representative action the, the, the qualified entities there is, is quite broad it's up to the national up to the national um member states to, to to determine who qualifies um and um under the directive member states have to have at least one representative action me mechanism on their statute book to allow a qualified entity to bring this form of action um, and uh, as I say, quite a lot of freedom in the directive, subject, however, to it being um, the principles being um, compliant with the objectives of the directive. In relation to cross-border representative actions, which is really, I think, where we're all interested in, in, in the sense of what we're talking about today, because this, of course, is the area where we're dealing with all the issues we've just been discussing about cooperation, uh, bringing together different um, di different national interests, etc., and this is where it's a little bit more complicated. To be honest, the cross-border representative actions, they um, the directive harmonised the criteria for designation as a cross-border qualified entity, um, and lays down a series of um, criteria for you better for, for the entity better to, to better qualify. Which are relatively strict, and they they include um, a track record of twelve months of public activity and protection of consumer interests. Uh, the entities have to be not for profit; they have to be uh, independent, etc. Um, we haven't got time to go into the de in, in in all detail, but um, we um, I think what we can, what we can conclude from that list is that the the kind of the possibilities are pretty limited. Uh, and we're looking at consumer associations, not for profit entities bringing this, these claims. The problem that I'm going to raise here is, is really whether these qualified entities are really a resource and able and willing to be able to bring expensive cross border claims. Um, um, I'm not at all sure that they are going to be um, uh, resourced and are ready to do that. And so I wonder if really the effective directive is really going to be more effective in relation to domestic actions 
where those those jurisdictions which don't have a collective redress system are going to have to get up to speed pretty quickly. So, so I'm a little bit, say, maybe a little bit long, yeah. but I hand hand back to you, Ariel. Thank you very much, Duncan. I must say that I'm sharing the same worries that you are uh, uh, expressing because uh, if uh, only qualities uh, entities can bring uh, collective redress in its on opt-in basis then uh, I have a feeling that uh, Europe will not move forward with many cases. Although uh, there is a provision on uh, funding, uh, which is very good. Uh, Yannicka, one word, and then I would like to hear uh, uh, Professor Howell's reaction to the recent developments in Europe. So please, Yannicka, and then... Yeah, just, yes, just Professor one word also, because I promised uh, Duncan to chip in on that topic. Uh, and maybe to reassure you uh, as well, Ariel, because I had a similar concern. And then I chatted a bit with policymakers and I reread the directive again. And just, uh, and it is indeed complicated, as Duncan pointed out, but it, it makes very clear that cross-border has a different meaning that all of us at first glance would think. We will all be thinking cross-border are all these cases, the international cases, but the cross-border action in the directive are defined differently and only mean basically that if um, um, an entity that is um, established in one jurisdiction wishes to file an action, collective action in another jurisdiction, only then we are talking of cross-border action. So basically, the current situation maintains, uh, like for the Netherlands and, and, and uh, for all other jurisdictions, and only if um, a Dutch entity, for example, because that is close to, to home for me, um, would like to bring an action in Germany, only then it has to be this designated entity. But everything that has been done so far um, um, by ad hoc foundations um, as far as they meet the domestic criteria, they can still file this uh, international or cross-border cases in the Netherlands. And that is important to, to recognize no. this difference. So yeah. you would gamble that until our next conference, you will see a lot of uh, class action uh, uh, litigation in Europe, I understand. Yeah, that, can I just react to that? Can I just react to that area as well? I mean, I, I take Yannicka's point and the thing I didn't mention is the case when there are, there's a single um, action brought by a number of different designated entities in one jurisdiction uh, in, and that that I think is qualified as a domestic action. So that 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 I think I mean the domestic cases that Yannick are talking the about. The approach is more liberal towards domestic actions. Which is then yeah. So I mean so that is where you could I mean that is I think the potential for development where you bring everyone together in one jurisdiction, um, where there is one home, if you like, one home designated entity, and everyone else then joins into that, teams up. So you can have designated entities from around Europe. Who then get this? Then obviously there were issues of coordination that we've already discussed. But then that is as as a domestic um, action. Then you've got less of the problems that we've just discussed in cross border. Even though it's not really a purely domestic action, it's really got an element of cross border aspect to it because you've got a whole panel of others. That may be where where it works out because it also addressed the point I just made earlier on about resources, about funding, etc. Maybe if you've got a group of, of entities in iconic litigation, this is not going to be in cases every other day, but it's going to be iconic piece of litigation, I think, which go right across the European Union. You know, we can think of lots of those that we've come across recently. Um, there it could be, that could be quite interesting. Thank you very much. And let me ask uh, Professor Howells, how do you feel about uh, consumers in the future? Will it, uh, the new directive will change their position? Will we see a, lo a lot of collective redress in Europe? Will the enforcement be better? You, are, you have to unmute yourself. Well, thank you, Ariel. I was very nervous about being on this panel because I thought maybe I wouldn't be able to contribute too much having been away in Asia for five years as a university administrator. Uh, but it's actually reassuring to hear that the 
the same topics that were being discussed by LF are still being discussed. We had a recommendation and we, we, are, we have a lot of proposals. Recently, a proposal for a directive. Is that what you missed in the last few years? Yeah, so... I'm, Nothing to worry about. So this was a good opportunity for me to catch up. And I suspect that if I went away for another five years, we'd start to really start to see the shoots of uh, litigation taking off in this area. Because what I've noticed is there's the European directive. I'd like to say a few things about that but also some other signs that actually class actions are starting to be um, something that businesses are paying attention to. And you only need to see that by the amount of law firms who are commenting on these, these actions. Um, as regards the European directive, I think part of the background to this is actually that um, consumer organizations, qualified entities are very different in the different member states. Um, there are some countries where you and me, Ario, could form an, a consumer association and people like that do do that. And there's hundreds of consumer associations. So I think that's why to bring the, the cross border action, the commission wanted it to be um, with fixed criteria to make sure that it was a really substantial independent entity that was able to bring this high level uh, action. Now, and I should also say that public bodies can be involved in these actions as well. But again, as you travel around Europe, which I used to do before I went to Asia and before COVID, you see that actually the willingness of public bodies to do that varies dramatically as well. So there may still be some countries in Europe that don't really have effective consumer organisations, don't really have public bodies want to take actions. And so there may still be a big disparity between the member states. The other issue I would say is about funding, and I don't know, maybe uh, Ianka and Duncan can tell me this. There are some consumer associations which are very professional in bringing actions on behalf of their members. The Austrian Consumer Association comes to mind as one that has worked very closely with private practice lawyers to create a model where their members can bring claims and the private practice lawyers will actually take a lot of the funding on and, and bring the cases. So if that model worked, you could see very easily that a qualified entity could decide to bring an action and then it could actually become a reality because behind them, they have lawyers and litigation funding that can actually bring it. So I don't know whether that is really going to be possible in this model, but if it is, then you can the really see it. The Netherlands, it works with a stick thing. It works well, well, in, the, in the Netherlands, it does work with this kind of stick thing that they are setting there with the finance of lawyers from the US sometimes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, just with this. Sorry, sorry Yanka. No, I just wanted to respond to your question about these professional um, entities that are uh, able to bring these mm. actions professionally. It's actually a bit of a con controversy about that right now in the Netherlands because we had the Fortis settlement, which was this huge. Uh, biggest ever uh, shareholder uh, settlement that we had in the Netherlands and the Dutch Investor Association, which is very active and um, always bringing cases, one of the few within Europe um, that is actually um, um, really, you know, having meaningful contribution to collective redress actions, negotiated for themselves a fee of 25 million and uh, which wasn't any thing near the cost that they've made to this action so it was really a fee um an extra fee to uh cross sponsor you know other uh, actions um and although the court approved that it was almost like under duress if you would read mm -hmm. um the, the the ruling um the court was very very critical about the vp doing that and one may wonder whether they would approve it again and the the theory or the uh, philosophy or the vision of the court was that if you're a non-profit entity and you claim that you um, litigate for the whole group and then you um, agree with a settlement that um, makes differences between subcategories um, 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 and on top of that you um, also negotiate for yourself such a fee uh, then that puts you in a difficult position. Um, and then we had a situation with Dutch Consumer Association, which was looking at the investor association being so successful, wanting them also to be successful. And their solution was to set up a GV, a joint venture with a commercial funder, 
that would finance these cases. Uh, and they are thinking that this is the way for them to deal with, with the issue of funding and of potential agency issues. But I am wondering whether that is going to work because in the end of the day, they are partnering the joint venture and they will receive half of the profits as a partner. So either we have to accept that these entities cannot properly function and be efficient if they are not backed by commercial initiatives or if, if you do not allow them to um, no. deploy such activities or we have to um, to accept that they will not be able to pay any meaningful role. So I do agree with um, with you and with, with Duncan that these new provisions on funding uh, in this um, <clears throat> European um, latest European legislation are really very important. Yeah, and I don't want to, to interfere, but uh, if you listen to the previous panel, then Professor uh, Maria Glover told us about a new decision in the US uh, to, which supported payment to class representative, which to my mind is very important. Yes. But uh, please, Professor Howells, yeah, continue. Think, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was so, just a few more points. Um, the other point I'd say is, I think you're right that there's not gonna be a lot of cross-border action here. You're not gonna have entities taking action over countries. And you only have to look back at the injunctions directives and the lessons of that. Um, when there was a power for people to bring injunctions in other countries, you saw the OFT try to do it in the Duchesne case in Belgium and really got itself tied up in a lot of complex litigation. And it hasn't really worked. And what happened there instead was a corporation model where you actually try to get the uh, local regulators to take the action instead. And I think actually, um, you know, this is probably uh, a better way forward that, you know, I have some hesitation about the Dutch model where one court can bind the whole of Europe, but um, I think maybe, you know, thinking about domestic actions with cross territorial control, um, effect may be of interest. Just another point, a general point, this is part of the New Deal for Consumers. And another issue in the New Deal for Consumers was uh, really quite stringent regulatory penalties. And if you think of class actions really as being a regulatory tool, um, you know, what do you think of uh, as a business, if, you've, if you say, for example, breach data protection law and you get um, a, a, a massive fine based on your turnover and you get a class action for the same breach, how do you um, marry these two systems up, the regulatory and the class action? How do they sit together? Um, so that's interesting. Um, other things I, I noted since I came back was there is a provision about follow on in the directive, I think which combines the uh, regulatory and, and, and private actions are following. Well, uh, in, in the, the, there needs to be some sort of thinking about how the two systems sit together. But, um, you know, of course, you may also be hit by regulators in different countries uh, and so on. So there's lots of issues there to, to be thinking about. Um, obviously, what I also picked up was the amount of tourism, uh, class action tourism was in the UK courts, not back in recent days, but one or two successes along the way. But also we don't just... have any tourism for the last year, Professor Howell. Sorry? No tourism. There will be no action. We have no tourism yeah, yeah. for the it, last year. Stop, we have pandemic. Stop the lawyers. They, 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 they find ways around this. <laughs> um, um, also, um, you know, just just the, the willingness of the courts to be open to inventive things. I was reading the case of Lloyd and Google today uh, for this uh, provision, and the courts willing to sort of define damage in, a, in an interesting way to say, you know, what would you have charge for access to your data that could be your, your damage and uh, the willingness to let a case go ahead i understand also a data protection case involving easyjet uh, had a number of thousands of people signed up to it and of course in the competition area where the uk has perhaps um been ahead um of other areas um you've got a case which i think has been heard in may by the supreme court american mastercard and again you know um you know, if that if that is allowed, you, you, you're going to see a, a, a context in which class actions will prosper. So there does seem to be um, a willingness now to allow these things to go ahead and a liberalism, especially if you compare it to the old cases on representative actions where they try to find any way to find no similarity between the, the partners, where it seems to be fairly obvious they were similar. You see a great deal more willingness now for this. So I suspect um, that we might... Um, in five years' time, start to see 
class action taken off in Europe. Um, there's also this talk of this European ombudsman. And I think actually, if you want to have real European wide class actions, you probably do need some sort of coordinated body like that. But again, we've heard of these things and they've been discussed, they sound nice, but they very rarely come to fruition. So, I mean, my sense is that we are at a very interesting time. And I think that I always like this conference, Ariel, because you bring us in touch with practitioners and with the US. And of course, the US has gone through many of these debates about how this works. But um, we have got this uh, unique idea in your about the representative qualified entity. But again, whether that really is unique, if, if lawyers can sit behind the entity, uh, that'll be, I think, uh, an interesting challenge for us to work out going forward. Yeah. So if I may, uh, so thank you very much. And um, I suggest that you won't uh, go now for five years because uh, we will see a lot of developments in the area uh, of class action. So stay with us, please. Don't go for five years again. <clears throat> well, and indeed, uh, I, I was reading just uh, checking up again uh, one of the Irish law firms predicting that if Ireland now institutes a class action procedure after Brexit, the island may now become a favoured venue for many of these claims. So. Uh -huh. Uh, I hope to welcome you all to Ireland to discuss these issues. Why not? Yannicka and Duncan, last words for the panel, please. Yannicka. Your summary. My summary is that um, we will um, have our own European way of dealing with with collective redress. I think the discussion on arbitration clauses, etc., makes wish. it clear. Uh, and I also think that the fact that third party funders have entered the European market is going in five years time uh, to be a real game changer and to uh, influence the dominance of American firms uh, in Europe. Maybe this were my famous last, famous last words, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> It's all recorded. Be careful. Yes. Duncan. Yeah, no, I, your summary. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in the happy sort of position to be able to agree entirely with what I've just heard from Yannicka and, and Grein. I think Grein, yes, yeah, picked up on an interesting point there about the, uh, the representative actions uh, via the qualified entities, maybe just being a bit of a, an initial push. And then behind that, then you may have the law firms and what have you um, building up on that. I, I can certainly see that. And I can certainly see that link to what we just said earlier on about a single claim in one in one place. I think that can work. I just think I just one final word of caution. We are asking our consumer associations to do a lot. We are really being asked to do a lot. And the, the thing that worries me is there is a loser pays rule in that directive and i just wonder how many you know boards of consumer associations are really going to want to put their head on that particular block and take that risk for you know the good of european consumers they will risk, have to use the risk of being, until they then. yeah so you know Let's see. Let's hope it does work out. I mean, I think there was certainly is a you feel you feel that there are so many developments in so many different areas, as we heard earlier, in date in the data area, in antitrust, in products cases, in the emissions. You just feel that the you know the movement is a little bit more unstoppable now. How we get there, we'll we'll find out in the next few years as things as things evolve. Okay, I would like to thank you, Yannicka, Duncan, Gerent, and uh, Justice Dow, who left, uh, who just left us. I think it was a wonderful panel. Uh, since it's the last session, I would like to thank all the participants who stayed with us uh, from around the world. I think it was a very good conference. The ideas that we had were <laughs> wonderful, and we learned a lot from one each other. And I want to thank you all. Thank you very much. See you. Well, Thanks. can I thank you, Ariel, on behalf of everybody, because you've been um, a real inspiration to everybody. You've kept these conferences going for several years now, and COVID didn't stop them happening. And um, <laughs> I, I yeah. never imagined that um, I would uh, be, when I knew you as a student in England, as a young student all those years ago, I never realised you'd become one of the most eminent scholars in this field. So it's really great to have you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really with the energy to do these conferences.
Thank you very much. I hope to continue. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Have a good Cheers. weekend. Bye. Bye. Bye.